you've got to have that hunger and that competitive edge um, to when you want something. You know what I mean? You got to you got to go out and get it. This is Property Investory, where we talk to successful property investors to find out more about their stories, mindset, and strategies. I'm Tyron Shum, and in this episode, we're speaking with Matt Sharma, former professional rugby league player for the Gold Coast Titans. You'll hear how he delved into property despite aspiring to be an athlete his whole life, how the many hardships throughout his rugby career influence his mindset, and how he has built up his portfolio in a short amount of time. We find out a bit more about Matt Sharma and what he currently does. 29 years old from the Gold Coast, originally from Brisbane and Queensland. So, Queensland born and bred. And um, I guess, uh, yeah, my identity, so to speak, I was a former um, NRL athlete, professional athlete, then turned real estate agent, then turned um, a high performance coach for younger athletes. And whilst doing all of this, I've been uh, a property investor on the side, um, really enjoy that and also about to become an entrepreneur and start uh, my buyer's agency business as well. So, um, yeah, that's in a nutshell. The multitasking investor delves into what a typical day in his life looks like. At the moment, I, uh, I coach uh, basically aspiring athletes with the Gold Coast Titan uh, NRL side. So. Literally from 12 years old all the way up to sort of 22 years old, basically a high performance environment where we look after kids who are aspiring to be, um, yeah, up and coming athletes. We, we mentor them, coach them and lead them on the right path and yeah, do that on a day to day basis. Um, yeah, with all the property stuff as well. Before delving into the property side of things, Shrama shares a bit about his upbringing. I grew up in Brisbane in a suburb called Forest Lake. Uh, sort of southwest Brisbane, nice, nice suburb. It's it's sort of um, it's coming a long way. It was like one of those larger estates back in the day where um, you know families built their forever homes type thing. So yeah, it's, it's actually quite a nice suburb. I enjoyed it. Went to school there from literally uh, preschool all the way to high school at Forest Lake State High School. And um, yeah, the only reason I'm down the Gold Coast now is because um, when I um, signed my contract with the, the Titans. I made the move down to the Gold Coast and haven't left since. I guess you, you can say it's for work reasons. <laughs> yeah, for work, for work reasons. But then once once I finished that chapter, I realised, oh man, the beach is a bit better than the lake I had up there in Brizzy. So <laughs> beautiful down here. He goes on to share at what stage in his life he delved into rugby. My mindset was always to become a professional athlete. So you'll see a lot of guys literally from graduation at year 12 they'll go straight into basically a full-time professional athlete so mine was a little bit different I, I that was my goal but um, I didn't quite get there at 18 I was sort of hustling and working hard uh, to try and get a contract so um, on the side I was working in you know doing anything warehousing laboring just all different sort of jobs to facilitate um, you know my passion of chasing being a professional athlete so um, yeah, I worked, worked pretty long hours, like I'd train and then go to the warehouse, do some work there, and unpack containers and stuff and then train again in the afternoon. So, yeah, it was a, it was a good slog but um, yeah, I ended up getting there in the end at um, basically 20, oh sorry, 19 years of age, I ended up signing with the Gold Coast Club. The former rugby player explains how many hours he needed to commit to training whilst managing his heavy workload. Well, trainings were always... Um, generally in the morning in the junior grades. So when I was coming through the ranks around that 17 to 19-year-old age, um, you know, I'd, I'd go, I'd, sorry, I'd go to work in the mornings and work all day and then I was lucky enough I had a job where they would let me out at um, sort of 3 p.m. So I'd, I'd leave the warehouse at around 3 p.m., had around a good solid seven-hour day there. Then I'd drive down to the Gold Coast from Brisbane and then I'd, spend the next sort of two to three hours doing gym and field fitness down there um, and that was sort of the routine. Now drive home around, get home pretty late. I was really fortunate. I was living at home at that stage so mum had the, had the food on the table <laughs> ready for me which is lucky and then um, 
yeah, so that was that was the process for for a few years. So it was, it was tough, but definitely builds resilience. And when you've got a goal, uh, it's just like property investing as well. We always think of that. You hear that word, your why. So my why was to always become a professional athlete. No one in my family done it, and um, my brother and my dad got close. And um, yeah, I really wanted to. I was the baby of the family, so I was sort of the last last hope of, of getting there. So I really wanted to become a professional athlete. Shrama shares whether he did a lot of training to become an athlete before moving to the Gold Coast. I guess in primary school, like you, you play for the fun of it and you enjoy it and you know, you make rep teams and stuff like that. But once you get into sort of high school and, and late high school, you start, um, the training starts picking up obviously. So yeah, I've always, I've always loved my training, um, so to speak. It was always, I was, again, I always had that common goal why. Like, so when times are tough and I was tired after a big day's work, it's sort of like, well, I know if I put the work in, you know, it's all going to be worth it in the end. So, and just staying consistent with that. So, I guess, yeah, like, like anything in life, I know it sounds cliche, but I've, I've seen it firsthand in the athlete world. It's like hard work and consistency will always be natural natural talent hands down he looks back on the time in his life when he realized he could actually become a rugby player as the career requires a lot of strength and fitness it's a funny one like there was a point probably when i was uh 17 18 and i actually got cut from um finally enough from the titans i was i was in our junior squads so um as a 17 18 year old in our junior squads and i actually missed out on the final cut to make our under 20s side and um, then I, I basically stopped travelling to the Gold Coast. I, I stayed in, obviously just stayed at home and played for a local team in Ipswich and in, in the South East Queensland competition and um, yeah, at that, at that point it was more, it, it really hurt obviously to be cut but um, that was sort of a time in my life where I sort of thought, oh maybe this isn't for me, you know, you know, um, professional sport and stuff like that but then yeah I know it again it sounds cliche when your why is strong enough you know you'll you'll push through that so I just I just stayed out I didn't really care that they cut me I um I just kept working hard and uh, worked long hours and then was doing my trade at, at Ipswich the football team there and um I had two really good years there and, and won some awards and then um a few clubs came knocking and then I decided to to go back to their Titans, they actually let me go, and then they wanted me back, and I sort of felt, um, yeah, that was my calling, calling on the Gold Coast. I really wanted to become like a NRL player for the Titans. He goes on to explain what it's like to be a full-time professional rugby league player. I guess from a from a macro level, yeah, you're 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 paid to be the best athlete you can be. I guess it's it's like you're it's like you're an entertainer so to speak, you know what I mean? So everything is geared towards making sure your body's right, making sure you're fast, you're strong, making sure your knowledge base is strong. So video and analysis constantly, um, you know, extras, improving, self-growth, you know, doing all the extra sort of things. And then I guess what from a micro point of view, some people might not see, like you do a lot of community stuff, like we're, we're us as a club, we're big on, supporting our local community and school. So you do a lot of those sort of visits and visit, you know, put kids in hospital and, um, you know, you might go to school and run a session there and uh, just promote the brand and yourself around that sort of stuff as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot of positives to it. I really enjoyed it. But I guess what people don't see is the hardships and the roller coaster of um, emotions and stuff like that because, you know, you're so invested in it and it is a bit like a bubble. So um, your whole world revolves around, um, yeah, you, you basically making that side. And if you're not in that side, you could be injured, might not make the side. You know, you're playing good one week, you're cut the next week. It's, uh, and then you're, they'll cut your salary. Like, it's pretty cut, so you always got to be at the top of your game. And there's always someone above you that you're chasing and there's always uh, someone younger than you hunting for your spot as well. So, um, yeah, you always got to be on your game. Reflecting on his time with the Titans, he shares with us the hardships and the challenges he experienced. Something that doesn't get spoken about and that's why I respect, um, you know, I respect a lot of industries, of course, but I know, obviously know the athlete space really well and what athletes go through, not just rugby league, like all athletes in general. And 
even the toll it takes on um, families and stuff like that. Like, like for instance, I had teammates who, um, you know, they sign a deal, just say on the Gold Coast, and then they're cut, and then they're told, you know, they're not wanted here, and then they have to literally shift their whole family to keep, move the kids out of school who they just made friends with, and then like travel over, they have to go to England or. Um, somewhere, you know, that they didn't want to really go and things happened like literally in 24 hours, like you might be signed with the Gold Coast, next minute you're getting told you're not wanted and um, you've got to pack up and leave to Sydney if you want to keep your dream alive. So there's a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, for me personally, I was really lucky. I was a one club man. I, I played for the Gold Coast the whole time. Um, I, I signed um, a long-term deal there, which is really good. But um, for me, my biggest um, struggle was definitely with injuries and stuff like that. So, like, you know, my first three years as a, you know, 19 year old coming in the first grade and debuting at 20 years old, basically like living the dream, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm winning man of matches, I'm our starting hooker, um, you know, in TV and media, all that sort of stuff. And then probably two years in, you know, I get one injury and then I'm out for a few months. And then um, I basically had about six six to seven injuries back to back all up I had sort of nine surgeries throughout my short career and um, that was really tough to sort of be on the spotlight and then basically no one even knows where you are you're basically on your own training and rehab and getting your body right and then I'm back in there back in there again work hard and then you know I'll get a dislocated shoulder so yeah it was a, it was a really tough trot with the injury um, just mentally staying focused and Saying, um, because I see a lot of guys, you know, they might even have just one or two injuries and it really, really knocks them around because, you know, they, they obviously didn't plan to have that. So for me, it built a lot of resilience and I, I really enjoyed that process. As funny as it sounds, it, it made me um, who I am today. And it, it, yeah, but yeah, it was tough. There's a plenty of tough moments. It's, a, it's an emotional roller coaster. You ask any athlete, it's, it's definitely an emotional roller coaster. Strama shares how his injuries have had a long-term impact on him, allowing him to focus on other things outside of being an athlete. I'm sure we will about the property stuff and that's how it all sort of started because I had extra time. But um, yeah, it's like to this day, like um, I always believe things happen for a reason and with every sort of setback, there's, there's blessings that come out of it. And uh, as funny as it sounds, yeah, I had a heap of injuries and I had to work really hard to maintain them. But um, funnily enough, like now, post-career, and um, I still really enjoy my fitness and, and looking after my body. My body's probably the best shape it's ever been because I've worked so hard at trying to get it to a level where I'm not in pain. So it's beyond that now. It's more like I've improved actually where I was as a young kid. So, But yeah, you're exactly right. It, that, that's why I ended up retiring. I got doctor's advice, you know, at 26, you know, I had nine surgeries and they're sort of saying, well... You know, footy's not everything in life. You got to take a, you know, it would, you've got to be able to run with your children one day and stuff like that. So um, that's where I weighed things up and realised, you know, there is more to life than just being an athlete. It's really fascinating to hear it from that. I mean, like, 26 is still extremely young. Most people are just finishing either university and just starting, and you've just retired. Yeah, I know. It's and it and it's funny, Tyrone. Like, I, I look at I look at it now, and like I'm st- I, I still. I have to tell myself I'm still young. Like it's it's just funny. Like any athlete, because it's such a small window. Like you're literally thrust into the scene at like 19 with these grown men. So yeah, do you know what I mean? Like you sort of grow up pretty quick. But um, I have to keep reminding myself, like far out. Like I like looking back now, man. I was just a baby. Like in my even maturity level in terms of just life, where where. You know, now that I'm 29, I'm sort of like, man, I was such a baby. And then it's funny, like, me talking about this now at 29, probably when I get to 30, 40, I'll be like, man, I had no idea what I was talking about in my 20s. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right, but it's, it's, a, it's a, you are so young when you're, you're in the app, so you have no, you don't know any different. Yeah. Drama goes on to talk about how his family background in sport influenced him to pursue a career in rugby. Pretty standard story, you know, dad played, um, he didn't play professionally, he, he was always a hard worker, he nearly got there and then obviously that transitioned on to my older brother, he played, he nearly got there, he played um, semi-professional, you know, still was working and stuff like that, never got to the NRL but he was, um, 
he was sort of close and stuff like that. So yeah, it just got passed down really. And and I, I always laugh about it. Like me and my brother used to compete on everything. Like he was six years older than me, and um, yeah, just always getting beaten throughout my whole childhood. And um, yeah, and it's funny. I look back now, and it probably that's the reason why I think I ended up getting there in the end is because I'm so used to losing, you know, and always like wanting to beat him with everything. And um, I think anything in life, like especially sport, but same that you can relate it to investing as well. Like you, you've got to have that hunger and that competitive edge um, to when you want something, you know what I mean? You've got to, you've got to go out and get it. Like it's not going to come to you sort of thing. So um, I think it's just been passed down from my, my, yeah, my family. Yeah. He goes on to share the stage in which he finally took the plunge into property. It's an interesting one because looking back now and knowing what I know, I, and it's you hear it with a lot of investors. What's what's the one thing you wish you did? You change, and you know it's usually oh, I wish I got into it earlier. And um, for me, that's definitely the case as well. Like knowing what I know now, like you know I was on a I was on a contract um, to play professional sport at 1920 I could have like now that I know about servicing and all that sort of like I should have taken advantage of um, the banks and you know in stuff like that but I just had no idea about property at all so it actually I got into property um, pretty much when I retired it's, it's a funny story I was sitting in a um, in a waiting room for um, I had an injury and it was one of my last injuries before I retired and um, just sitting in the waiting room and they had the magazines, you know, the, just the magazines in the waiting room, like the new idea and um, all, the, all the women weekly or whatever it is. And there was there was a random like Australian property API mag. I think it was API, whatever the magazine's called. Yeah, some, yeah, one of, yeah, one of them older style ones. And um, yeah, I just picked that up and started reading it. And I don't know, it, it sort of like hooked me straight away. Like it sounds weird, like, there's a lot of just stories like of people doing in property and then a lot of graphs and numbers and I, um, I love all that sort of stuff as well. And um, yeah, it, re- it really, really interests me that property, people were actually buying property not to live in, like people were like using it as like an investment vehicle. So um, yeah, I, I still laugh about it to this day. Like I actually took the mag home. It's still got the sticker on it. This is property of the X-ray place. So I will give it back to them one day. I promise that, but uh, <laughs> I, I did. Yeah, yeah, I, man, that's that's how much I loved it. And I, I've never seen that magazine before. I, I just didn't even know they made magazines on property. Limits. So I was like, man, I've got to, I really have to take this. I don't know where I'll find it. And then I ended up seeing them in like news agencies. So yeah, it just used to flood my brain with um, that sort of content and YouTube and, and stuff. Like that. And that's how I got into it. But yeah, to answer your question, that was pretty much at the back end of my Career, yeah. What year was that roughly that you actually started looking at your first property? I retired in 2016. I got my first property in 2014 and then my first investment property at 2015. So, yeah, yeah, basically just had an owner OC and one investment. Um, yeah, pretty much when I re- retired. But yeah, I could have definitely capitalized a lot more if I knew what I knew now and stuff. But as I said, I, I, I I'm happy with um, what happened. You win and you learn, don't you? He looks back on the first property he purchased and shows how he found it. For me, my um, my journey was a bit a bit different. Like I, I went the owner OC first and investment after that. But for me, I looking back, like I probably would have went like in investment first. To be honest, now knowing again, now knowing what I know and things like that. Um, I didn't know too much about investing, so to speak. I, I knew a little bit about property. So, yeah, I, I just, in 2014, I got, um, yeah, like an owner. Like I still actually live here now and it's, it's um, yeah, it's got land content. It's, it's close to the beach and um, I didn't know a thing about negotiation at that stage. So, um, looking back again, I probably could have saved a lot more money if I knew what I was doing then. I didn't even know what, building a pest. I had nobody sort of to lean on, like with the process. Um, obviously, the agent always working for the seller and they, they, they help you to a degree, but I generally felt like I had no one to lean on to because no one in my family was into property or anything like that. So, 
um, yeah, I just sort of went on YouTube and typed in, you know, things like what's a uh, broker and what's a solicitor and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, just learned as I went, learned as I went. So yeah, got got this first property that's done really well now. Pure coincidence, pure coincidence. It was a, it, as they say, the location does a lot of heavy lifting. So I was in a, yeah, it's just really close to the ocean and it's obviously you can't build east. So um, yeah, and it experienced some good growth down here on the um, the Gold Coast at that 2014 mark. He delves more into how he was inspired to get into property after picking up that first Australian Property Investor magazine. It was like a meant to be moment because, um, you know, I was, well, after I bought that owner occupier, the first one, you sort of like, oh, it's like, some, for some people, that's the dream, isn't it? Just to buy, you know, an owner occupier and pay it off in 40 years or whatever. But, um, you know, I was still, still earning money and, um, you know, I was a single guy just living in, not real too many expenses other than that mortgage and um it's like well what is your i I just loved education so the more you start reading and learning your mindset changes so i guess my mindset started shifting after you know the usual like rich dad poor dad and um you know you you just see other people and learn about leverage and all that sort of stuff and that's when i started thinking like i i just used to put my savings in a term deposit at the bank and then I'd be like, oh yeah, you get a return, but obviously, you know, like you can get a way better return than that. So, um, yeah, that's when I, I I got really into like, okay, how can I invest for the purpose, not to live in, to actually generate some some wealth in terms of cash flow and capital capital growth. So, yeah, that's when I got in the rabbit hole, and as you know, once you're in the rabbit hole, it's hard to get out. It's um, it's a, it's a really interesting world, the property investment space. And there's always something to learn. No one knows everything. You know what I mean? I, 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 I think there's so much to learn in that space. Matt Sharma starts by revealing how many properties he currently holds in his portfolio. At the moment, there's five in the portfolio. It sits around two and a half mil with a 60% LVR. So, yeah, they've all, they've all done pretty well. But um, I'm, I'm at the point now where... Um, and this is, I guess, another real big lesson I've learned as well is the power of um, servicing and stuff like that and how you can boost, um, you know, your, your case to the bank, so to speak, because, you know, I'm, um, you know, doing what I do what I love, you know, I, I coach and do that. But to be honest, it's a really low, it's a minimum wage job and um, being a single income earner on my own as well, um, you know, banks, banks will there's a, there's a ceiling basically and i'm nearly at that ceiling around the two and a half three mark once you get to that an asset value it's sort of like okay there's got i'm, I'm at a point now where I've, I've got to sort of um think of different ways to boost cash flow and um look at different things like that which which I'm, i've got in place at the moment but um yeah to answer your question yeah there's um there's five in there at the moment yeah he reveals one of the worst investing moments he has had throughout his journey got a, a quick little story on I dodged a bullet and I'm glad I did basically I was looking at uh, and this is a good one for investors because they might not realize it as well but um, you know I got to around my third fourth one and I started no it was my I was looking for my third property and I really was interested in like the dual not dual income not the brand new stuff like the Top upstairs, downstairs, like low, um, like the, you know what I mean? Like the dual living, dual G- living. Dual oak, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like a dual living set up, like an established one, not not brand new. So an old style property had the upstairs, downstairs. Anyways, I found this one and the, the, the ROI, like the rental yield was at nearly like 8%, 8.5% sort of thing. And, um, you know, there was, there was room to manufacture equity and stuff like that and I, I just sort of looked at it I was like oh yeah for sure and then um, something happened with the ins- oh, building a pest failed on it and so I, I don't know it just needed a bit more than a little it was like structural sort of stuff so I walked away from the deal but then um, I did a bit more research and spoke to solicitor and property managers and stuff and then realised um, you know you just got to be careful with the upstairs downstairs if it's not legal hide and if it's not Sort of by, so the guy was renting it, but it wasn't by the books or anything. It was all sort of 
um, you know, under 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 grace. Cash on hand. Yeah, cash in hand, and and um, you know, for insurance, like if something happens to the tenant downstairs, you're like like all these sorts of things, and it sort of made me really because I was so interested in the yield. I didn't even think about like the risk um, type play, if that makes sense. So um, that I, I felt I was a better educated investor after that to really look at each property and, and assess risk first before diving into if the numbers look attractive, do your, do your due diligence is what I'm trying to say, where I, I probably didn't do enough on that, that purchase. I didn't end up getting it, but um, yeah, which, which worked out. So that was something that I, I, that was a big, big sort of lesson for me. And in terms of um, biggest mistake, I, I'd say, I would say, um, um, they've all they've all been pretty pretty good. I guess I guess the only thing would be my, one of my favourite sayings now is you make your money on the way in in real, in, in property and um, probably probably my first property as I said like the agent listed it at a price and then I just sort of looked at it and said, oh, yeah, I'll offer a little bit below that. And then, you know, I mean, we come to an agreement, whatever. Uh, but knowing what I know now, I think this is a negotiation is such a cool part of the process. I think and it's such a big one where you can make money on the way in just through a little bit of research and dialogue and stuff like that. So just little things like find out what the reason for sale is, you know, ask the, like, I don't get why people don't ask like, Hey, do you mind me asking what the reason for sale is here? Yeah. You know I mean, and obviously I ask in a kind way, like, yeah, you know I mean, and most of the time they'll, they'll tell you and then um, do your research. You should know um, what's selling in the area in terms of a full bed, one bath, you already know roughly what that, and then as soon as a, mar- a property comes on the, the market, around that price and you sort of do your research and there is a bit of motivation, well, then you can you can sort of um, judge your offers off that and, it, it, and even things like terms. Like sometimes, sometimes if the motivation's high, you don't always have to negotiate on the price. You can actually negotiate on the terms like the building and pest and the finance and stuff like that. So I always, I always say to people who whenever I chat to friends or when I'm helping people is like get all your ducks lined up like your finance have your solicitor ready make sure everything's ready to go so when the right property does come you're a strong buyer and you can negotiate um, on different things like terms and, and the motivation to sell and settlement even settlement um, always ask like like is there a, is there a settlement term that would suit the seller you know make it feel like you're helping them so to speak so it's yeah, I, I found a lot of those things helped me when I was negotiating after property one. That really, I felt I got most of them well under market value. Yeah, that's really, really true because it's like trying to negotiate a win-win situation. You know, the vendors are looking to sell and actually don't mind having a longer term because they're probably looking for another place to move or they need to sell because they're having a divorce or whatever, you know, the reasons is. Negotiating the terms is probably also a key point, you know, not necessarily on price. But majority of the time, if there's an urgency, then price would obviously, you know, be a factor that plays. But yeah, all these things that you've mentioned is so, so important and simple questions but I think people just tend to overlook it because it's uh, if, you're, if you're not an investor it's, it's quite easily looking at the property and going falling in love with it emotionally and then you know offering whatever price and then if you start seeing a lot of buyers come in you go oh hold on there's a buying frenzy here I better offer <laughs> and, and then that's that's where uh, it just takes it out of the picture so 100% and you, you nailed it on the head that's one of my favorite things think of a negotiation as a win-win like not you against the agent and the sellers it's like how can I um, respectfully manipulate this scenario so it's like it's a win for me but also I've got to come across as if I'm trying to help the sellers as well and, and communicate that with the agent. So, you know, even and, and get, get along with the agent. I don't, so many people are so cold to the agent. It's like, be their friends. Like, oh, mate, they want to get paid. So it's like, work with them, man. You know, I, I always used to throw dialogue, like just say the name Jim or whatever, like Jim, mate. I know you want to get paid, man. Like, well, we'll, we'll get it done today. Let's go. You know what I mean? And they laugh with you and then we all work together. So that's how you get good deals, I reckon. Shrama reflects on the moment where everything just clicked for him. At the start and, and during, it's it's like when when you get the rental income coming in, like into your bank account and then 
um, you know, your repayments. If you've, if you've bought well and, um, you know, you, you bought at the right price and you got your loan structured properly and, you know, with, with all that side of things, um, you sort of look at your balance sheet and you're like, fire out. Like, it's just like another little income. Like, it's another little job. Like, you're getting paid X amount into your bank account from one property. Imagine if you had three properties or four properties or five or 10. You know what I mean? It's like these, it's like little side jobs in a way. That's how I see, I see the whole portfolio as a business as a whole. You know what I mean? So, um, the aha moment is like, I've got the, it's like, it's a business. There's, there's expenses and there's things you need to manage and control, but there's also income coming in. So it's like, ah, oh, this is like, this, you should take it serious. It's like, this is setting you up for, um, your future. Like, it, so yeah, the aha moment, I guess, is just realizing that this is bigger than just buying a property and putting a tenant in. It's, it's, um, you know, providing shelter for people and, getting a return on that and you're the you're the ceo of this like company if that's sort of it's kind of related in that sort of sense and I, I like to treat my portfolio in that sense like look at my spreadsheet and make sure everything's running smooth and property managers are doing what they need to do and uh, make sure the tenants are happy all that sort of stuff so um yeah the aha moment is like well yeah it's bringing in i'm going to bed each night and there's money coming in so yeah, it's like, yeah, just keep doing keep doing that. But yeah, don't ever and probably the the risk factor thing as well. Like I never like to over leverage on anything. So um that always helps as well. The successful investor shares at what stage he began to formulate his property strategy. It was more, okay, let me try and get some property with all the fundamentals. Do you know what I mean? All the all the basic stuff, like no high body corporate, land content, houses if possible, depending on the area, obviously. Um, you know, all the all the usual bread and butter stuff that all educated investors know. But as I went probably third and fourth one and even where I'm at now, I'm still continual learning. I'm I'm at a stage now where I've got some really good base assets that have done really well capital growth wise and you know, they're paying for themselves, but um, maybe I can shift the strategy a little bit to look at how I can improve cash flow um, because um, cash flow is king really you know capital growth um, is where the real wealth is at I, I still believe that but there's no point having a heap of capital growth properties if you can't hold them either and you can't sleep at night so um, for me it's like I want to I want to balance them I want to balance the portfolio so um, yeah it's pretty it's pretty much positive at the moment um, I'd like to invest into like one of the big majors like your Melbourne or Sydney, um, something like that for capital growth and also something with, with cash flow. But I guess in terms of strategy, like, yeah, something, something to balance each other out is what I'm trying to say. Maybe, um, yeah, I'm looking at it as a, as a macro, as a portfolio rather than the next one asset is my strategy. If that, if that sort of makes sense. Yeah. And I think, yeah. And I think a lot of the, best investors from what I've learned are, are sort of doing that, I guess, balancing their portfolio. He reveals some of his tips that he's currently implementing to increase his cash flow on his properties. I've spent the last two days, I've got a renovation coming up. Um, unfortunately, due to due to COVID and all that, it's unfortunate times. One of the tenants in one of my properties um, has moved out, been there since day one and, um, you know, a really good area, um, great little unit with the... Uh, two bed unit. So this was the very first investment property um, that I got. It's the only unit in my portfolio. So uh, they, yeah, they said they're leaving, which is fine. And then I, I, I got that unit back then on the basis of land component. So it's a, it's in a block of um, eight. So basically, I'm a one eight owner of you know a nice big solid corner block uh, close to the water and fundamentally you know everything low body core red old brick and it, it's really original like it's it's future it's, it's i don't like it like i would never <laughs> location wise beautiful awesome location in terms of interior yeah I, will, I don't like going in there and you know i'm i'm okay with that i left it as it is it's just getting its rent paying itself off but now seeing where it's at the tenants moved out and i've looked at how fast the um this tenant, the rental market has moved. 
Um, it's got some good capital growth, but now it's like, okay, I can take advantage of this rental growth now. How can I um, manufacture uh, that? So, yeah, just a simple simple renovation. Um, you know, you hear it all the time, manufacturing your own equity. So, um, yeah, through renovation, I'm just going to really do a basic, um, yeah, not overcapitalizing on anything, just kitchen, bathroom, uh, flooring, paint, and lights and fans. And literally, that's, that's it. So, hoping to spend the oh, max 5% of what it's worth, you know, somewhere around that. Um, tennish, tennish mark max, and then yeah, just get it. It's the rent will go up. Done the math, it should go up around fifty, sixty um, dollars a week. Uh, oh, sorry, forty to fifty dollars a week, um, based on where where is that in original condition, and yeah, it will improve the capital capital value a bit. But yeah, to answer your question, yeah, renovations probably a big one. If you if you're buying good on the way in, you know, you've got equity there, and then I guess if you can do a simple reno. You can also add equity there. Yeah, so I, I always like the secondhand stuff, stock. You know, that's just my preference. Some people like brand new, but personally, I like I like secondhand stock where the land component um, is the breadwinner, finding where, you know, where that's going to grow. And then, yeah, if I can improve the inside of it with a little reno, well, yeah, that's, that's a win in my books. But, yeah, everyone's got different strategies, I guess. Coming up after the break, we hear about the kinds of resources that have contributed to Shrama's success. You've got to be educated in what you, what you do. But oh, my go-tos, mate, uh, um, podcasts, like honestly, like yourself, um, the property couch is really good. The best advice he's ever received. Was, uh, I think it was on the, when I was on the property couch and the boys mentioned a little saying, it's like location does 80% of the heavy lifting. Um, really basic one. And that's next. I'm Tyrone Shum and you're listening to Property Investory. He discusses his strategy for the future and if he'll continue to buy and renovate or whether to branch out on other kinds of strategies. At this stage, probably in terms of my knowledge base, as I said, I'm a young guy and I, I by no means know much more than most people on this. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm forever learning and my capacity at the moment is just that. I don't know. I I, believe, I like um, development and stuff like that. Um, but to be honest, I just don't know enough about it. And, you know, I'm not, not one to sort of have a risk until I understand the process more than anything. And for me... I've just seen what's been working at the moment just with the buy and hold um, long term. Getting that fundamental base, I think, especially while I'm, I'm sort of in my 20s, I really just want those, those good bread and butter assets that I can keep adding value and growing. But as you said, um, now that I, I'm um, sort of got a good little foundation, yeah, I have looked into, you know, whether it's JVs or, um, you know, maybe like a dual looking at a legalized dual occupancy or flat shells or i've looked at everything looked at all the different sorts of styles and there's nothing that um that i'm fully educated and aware um of the process just yet and you know that's why i love reaching out to people so the more i'll keep learning and understanding the more i'll I'll look into it but um yeah at the moment i'm 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 just looking to get rich very slow not not sort of in the get rich quick scheme but I do, I do also believe in paying down debt as well. So um, that's a process, you know, once I get into my 30s or 40s, maybe I will do a JV or a capital play where I can pay down some debt on some of the properties, um, you know, to really extract them even, even more equity and, and put it somewhere else. So, um, yeah, but yeah, just, just at this stage, it's just accumulation, yeah. Strama goes on to talk about when he was a real estate agent and what it was like. I spent one year as a real estate sales agent working uh, for, my, for McGrath Estate Agents. Yeah, when, that was actually, I did that as I was retiring. It was literally, I was, I'd done my course while I was still playing. So, I'd, I'd finished training and do my course and then, uh, yeah, I became a sales agent and yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, I loved the process but then, um, yeah, I just, I, it sounds funny, I liked it is not. It's not really anything to do with buying. It's it's more a people game. 
which I, I enjoyed and I love sales. But um, yeah, I, I really wanted to get into, hence why I've started Spies Agency now. I, I got out of real estate, got back into the sports sector. Um, and basically, I've been in that while I'm sort of just building my buyer's agency now. But um, yeah, real estate was awesome. I learned, obviously, the other side of the negotiation and how to, how they market property. And um, yeah, some of the dialogue agents use. It's, um, yeah, it's really cool to know. Now, as a property investor, I always have that up my sleeve. Totally. And at least now you know how to deal with agents because you know how they play, play the game as well too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, ex- exactly right, and, that, and that's why I can't stress enough. Is like, man, they're they're doing the they're doing their job, so give them give them their respect. I know there is some out there, you know, to, there are some egos in the in the game, but at the end of the day, um, just through dialogue and um, simple tactics, you can actually um, really extract a lot out of the agent in, in that scenario of buying property. So, um, yeah, it's cool to know both sides of the of the coin, I guess. He shares with us the kinds of resources that have helped him along his journey. Yeah, shout out to YouTube. They were great old YouTube. <laughs> yeah, YouTube just got everything and anything, doesn't it? It's, um, oh, I used to just type in like property investing and then you'd, you'd see, oh, you see everything, don't you? Like the dudes in front of a Lamborghini and then you're just like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> and then, like saying you can get rich to re- retire in 24 hours it's like no i'm not doing that um so yeah there's, you got to be careful of what what's out there as well there's a lot of there's a bit of everything e- everywhere so you got to be educated in what you what you do but oh, my go-to's mate uh um podcast like honestly like yourself um the property couch is really good bryce and ben i've been on their podcast a few times um, they're, they're really good. They're changing the game, I think, in a positive sense. And also, um, uh, Australian Smart Property Investment podcast, they're really good. Your podcast, there's a few out there. And then also, just 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 um, just books, books, and um, and not even so much about um, finance. But the finance books are great, Rich Dad Poor Dad, and all those sorts of ones. But mindset, I think mindsets a big one, like understanding yourself being self-aware and um personal growth like understanding um how you react to things and like human behavior and um yeah mind i think mindset's huge because if you're not confident in anything you know i mean if you're not confident as an investor you'll make a rational decision and as you know like you you got to be clear-headed so I, I love stuff where it's like how can i be the best version of matt's drama as a, just as a person not as an investor because if I'm better as a person and I wake up each day healthier, happier, sharper, fitter, I'll um, I'll be a better investor, and that that, that stuff will come. But I don't think you can be a great investor or great anything, great athlete, anything if you are not looking after you and your brain and your your health. So yeah, I love the personal development books, podcasts, and YouTube. Yeah. Is there any one particular book that you'd recommend that people could read about mindset or personal development that you've really enjoyed? We could go on for days in this section. <laughs> but um no, no. <laughs> to save the save the bore the boredom of all you your listeners like I, I love personal I'm one of their personal growth junkies, but um um, get onto an actually just a quick one for the to add value. There's a there's a really cool app called Blinkist. I'm, I'm not like paid for or anything. Don't worry, but um that Blinkist app's cool. It's like shortened audio books in like 15 minutes of all the best personal development, finance, negotiate like all personal development books. Um, you can digest them in 15 minutes. So I listen to basically a new book every day when I make. My smoothie so it's um it's been unreal like in terms of that sense but some just off the top of my head without looking into my list um a really cool basic one is this is just like um more for relationships and people is that how to win friends and influence people i really like that like just i think to you need to have interpersonal communication skills and be able in any form of life i think like um and i think it helps with investing as well like when you're talking to agents and stuff like that and negotiating um what's another one um the ha- seven habits of highly effective people is a really cool oldie just a nice basic one um and yeah there's oh, 
Tools of Titans, a good one. Yeah, there's, there's, there's heaps out there. There's heaps out there. Out of, out of the maze. There's one caught out of the maze that, that one really struck with me. And that one's, um, about like, um, when things don't go to plan in life and resilience and stuff like that. So those sort of things I think are good because as an investor and as a human, you know, not everything goes to plan. You know what I mean? So it's, um, I think it's important to know how to deal with things like that so you're still sharp. Shrama reflects on the best advice he has ever received throughout his journey. Always had plenty of advice. Like I love quotes and stuff like that. Probably um, one that just sticks out just as you said it was, uh, I think it was on the, when I was on the property couch and the boys mentioned a little saying, it's like location does 80% of the heavy lifting. Um, really basic one so basic and I know there's a lot of variables to that but if you have that in mind like it's, it's pretty true like you yeah it does do most of the lifting like location um, could be it could be the best prop in the world but if it's in a poor location you know what I mean it's, it's you know what I mean it, it doesn't matter so yeah I think location does most of most of the lifting and yeah the one I said before is like you make you can make your money on the way in if he had some time to reflect on his past self 10 years ago, we find out what he would have said to himself. I would say be patient. Be patient um, is a big one. Um, be patient and play the long game. Just play the long game. It's, um, oh, and, and be patient, play the long game with consistency. So keep doing the little things that make a big difference but keep doing them every day. If you don't see results in the first two weeks, six months, whatever, if they're, but you're slow, you're getting little results, keep doing it and keep, keep, keep staying consistent with it. I think anything worth having in life, I think, whether it's property, whether it's sport, whether it's life, anything worth having won't happen overnight. It's going to take uh, persistence and hard work regardless. So, Keep being persistent with it. Keep refining your strategies as you go. Um, and yeah, don't ever think you know it all because once you think you know it all, that's when that's when you, you're in danger, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Shrama looks forward to the future where he shares what is happening for him in the upcoming five years. The next five years, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for 2020 and beyond, obviously. Um, I'm at a place now, um, you know, within the portfolio where I felt, um, you know, I, I understand uh, a little bit more than what I did than the last one, which is obviously each one I keep learning more. So um, I'm really, I've got a lot more clarity with what I want within the portfolio and I understand the game of finance a lot more now. So, uh, which has obviously led me to wanting to become an entrepreneur now. So it's like, I don't want to ceiling on my um, borrowing capacity so I can keep going. And the next five years for me is about, yeah, accumulation and um, building building a business and becoming an entrepreneur and, and really delving into that space. Because, um, yeah, it's been something I've always wanted to do. So, um, yeah, become an entrepreneur and also, um, yeah, just just um, with with the coaching, I want to keep coaching kids and stuff like that. I get a lot of fulfillment out of that. And yeah, just on a personal level, um, yeah, keep keep um, working hard and and staying, as you said, just staying consistent with everything and keep learning. Last question for you, Matt, is how much of your success is due to your skill, intelligence and hard work or how much of it is luck? Good question. I would say um, I would say we create our own luck, to be honest. I, nothing nothing annoys me more when, because um, it used to happen in sport a lot when when people would say, oh, he's so lucky. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, People don't see behind the scenes, and, and to a degree, yeah, that sometimes it's right place, right time. But um, I think we, what's the saying? I think we um, we we have to prepare for when those opportunities come. So, um, for instance, if a lucky opportunity does come, where somehow the universe is aligned, and and um, so for in, in property terms, like a deal just comes to play, like that like a unicorn deal and you're like if you're not prepared if you don't know the process if you don't know how to negotiate on the, you know what I mean you'll miss that opportunity same in sport like if you've got called in the NRL 
um, for next week and you haven't been doing all your little things like you haven't been sleeping well, you've been on, you know, you've been going out drinking and stuff like that, you're, you're going to go into that opportunity um, and not take it with both hands. So I think um, a lot of it is hard work and, as we said, staying consistent, boring as it sounds, staying consistent, being disciplined around your why and why you're doing it. And then when that luck does come, because I believe everyone's got luck, you know, everyone's got um, little points of life where the universe meets. And um, But, yeah, some of us don't take advantage of it and some of us are prepared and we, we nail it when it comes. So um, I think I think that's the most important thing. It's perspective as well. Like some people can't see the luck that's in their life. They're just looking at all the negatives. So um, perspective is a big one. Thank you to Matt Schrama, our guest on this episode of Property Investory. If you want to hear more about his journey and get a copy of the show notes on the website, head over to propertyinvestory.com forward slash notes. The show notes will give you the inside scoop of the little gold nuggets of wisdom all our guests share from their backstory and all the overall strategies and philosophies. Plus, you'll get a copy of their advice broken down and shared in a quick and easy to consume format. Just head over to propertyinvestory.com forward slash notes and download it today.